Good morning. The first item of business today is general questions, and our first question is number one from Ivan McKee. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government how it calculates the level of homelessness. Minister Kevin Stewart. President officer, the Scottish Government collect homelessness data from local authorities. This data collection provides detailed information on homeless applications by individual households, information on the number of applications under the homeless persons legislation, and the assessment decision of these applications is published on a biannual basis, along with a range of other data to help calculate the level of homelessness in Scotland. Ivan McKee. Uh, I thank the Minister for that answer. Um, over 750 people officially slept rough on the streets of Glasgow last year. Local authorities have a statutory duty to house homeless people, but last winter, Glasgow City Mission presented 202 rough sleepers to Glasgow City Council who were refused accommodation. Threatened with legal action, the Council then found accommodation for 98% of those individuals. What is the Scottish Government doing to ensure that local authorities meet their statutory obligation to find accommodation for rough sleepers without having to be threatened with legal action? Minister. Uh, thank you, President Officer. As uh, Mr McKee pointed out, uh, local authorities have a statutory duty to provide a minimum of temporary accommodation adv advice and assistance to all app applicants assessed as homeless. Uh, Glasgow City Council have the duty to provide housing and homelessness services in their area. And I know that the Scottish Housing Regulator have been working with Glasgow City Council to help improve the delivery of homelessness services in the city. As a government, uh, we are working to increase housing supply in Glasgow and across Scotland to improve the housing options that are available. Annie Wills. Thank you. Figures for the number of households in temporary homeless accommodation, however, show an increase between March 2015-16 by 1%. March's figures showing 10,555 households in temporary accommodation is an increase of almost 2,000 since 2007. Whilst I recognise there will always be a need for temporary accommodation, how does the Minister intend to make sure that this is not used as a long-term solution for homelessness? Minister. Uh, thank you, President Officer. There's been a continuing fall in homelessness applications uh, that to 34,662 in 2015-16. That's down 1,287 on the previous year, uh, a decrease of uh, 4%. Uh, of these applications, there were 28,226 households assessed as homeless or potentially homeless, and that's down 1,589 on the previous year, and that's a decrease of uh, 5%. Obviously, our um, key uh, uh, action in this parliament is to increase housing supply. Uh, we intend to deliver 50,000 affordable homes, uh, including 35,000 for social rent uh, during the course of this parliament, uh, which will help the situation greatly. Uh, and as I said earlier, we have um, the housing options hubs, which are working across Scotland to try and alleviate homelessness uh, throughout the country uh, and I hope uh, that their success continues and that we continue to see decreases as we've done in the last year. Question number two, Richard Leonard. Uh, thanks, Presiding Officer. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government, in light of the review of the Police Scotland estate, what impact the potential closure of police stations will have on public confidence in the police? Cabinet Secretary Michael Matheson. Uh, the Scottish Crime and Justice Survey suggests that the majority of people feel the police are doing a good or excellent job in their local area. The Police Scotland Estate Strategy, which was approved by the Scottish Police Authority on the 24th of June 2015, seeks to remodel the police estate to make it fit for the policing needs of the future. The Scottish Police Authority has made clear that local policing commanders will play a leading role in deciding whether any changes to the police estate are compatible with maintaining an effective local police presence. Engagement will be undertaken by local policing teams to ensure that future decisions are built upon local consultation with communities and partners. In many cases, the approach that has been taken is to seek alternative shared accommodation with partners in the same locality. There are already a number of positive examples of this in locations such as Livingston and Bailiston. Richard Leonard. I thank the uh, Cabinet Secretary uh, for that answer. I reflect, though, that the, the Cabinet Secretary wishes to decentralise the power to cut police services, but not the power to control police services. 
Shots Police Office serves the communities of Shots, Allenton, Hart Hill and Salisbury. When the public counter was closed in Shots Police Station in February 2014, a promise was made to the community that for reasons of public safety, as long as the prison was there, the police office would be there. Will the Cabinet Secretary remove Shots Police Station from the hit list? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I think the member should uh, engage with Police Scotland on this matter, and if he uh, did so, he would find that there has been no decision made on any of the police stations which have been set out at the present stage of the estate's review. Local commanders will consult locally on what the best approach is. With relation to shots, um, the, purpose the reason that they are looking at shots is because the existing facility is too large for Police Scotland. They are presently looking for alternative accommodation within the shots area. They intend to continue to have a presence within shots. If that is not feasible, they will be looking to try and draw other partners into sharing the facility with them in shots itself. So I think if the member is keen to make sure that the views of the local community and local elected members are, uh, are heard in this process, the way in which to do that is to engage with local commanders through their consultation exercise to allow local decisions to be made on what the best approach is for this matter. But it's also worth keeping in mind the purpose of this estate review is to make sure that it's an estate that is effective and reflects the demands on the police service. And that's why in the vast majority of cases, they're actually looking to relocate to shared premises. Kenneth Gibson. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree with Assistant Chief Constable Andy Cowie, who told the Local Government and Communities Committee yesterday that, and I quote, services are delivered by people, not buildings. The public want to see officers on the street and that following the review, service provision will be enhanced through investment in better located accommodation. Cabinet Secretary. Well, I do agree with ACC uh, Howie in this matter, who is leading the state's review uh, for uh, Police Scotland. The, uh, Police Scotland are very clear, as I say, this is not about removing police officers from communities. It's about making sure that they have a police estate which has evolved over 100 years that it reflects the changing nature of the demand on the police service. So, for example, the vast majority of contact with the police service is now through the 101 uh, call system. Uh, that reflects a changing nature in the way in which people engage with the police service. And we need to make sure that we have a police estate that reflects that change, while at the same time is able to support police officers in undertaking their role effectively. So, as Andy Cowie has highlighted, this is not about uh, seeking to remove uh, police officers from local communities. It's about making sure that we have an estate that is effective and reflects the needs of local communities. And the decision-making process in this will be driven by local needs based on the views of local commanders once they have consulted local communities. Question number three, Gil Patterson. Many thanks, Presiding Officer. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what impact leaving the EU will have on local government. Minister Kevin Stewart. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, local government shares the same ambitions as us for stronger communities, a fairer society, a thriving economy, and we will work in partnership with them to respond to the implications of the EU referendum outcome. The Scottish Government is exploring all options to protect Scotland from a hard Brexit that economists say will cost 80,000 Scottish jobs. Our five key interests are democracy, economic prosperity, social protection, solidarity and influence. European funding is important to local government. The 2007 to 13 programmes of the European Regional Development Fund and European Social Fund awarded £158.3 million to Scotland's local authorities, which was spent in the years 2007 to 2016. Uh, can I thank the Minister for that uh, answer? Uh, we know that the EU plays an integral part at all levels of government in helping to deliver important uh, projects. Therefore, can I ask the minister, uh, can the minister provide an update on the posi position with regards to payment of EU structural funds if the, e e uh, the UK was to leave the EU? Minister. Officer, since the outcome of the referendum, we have urged the UK Government to provide clarity and certainty on these vital European funds. The UK Government guarantees offered to date for European structural funds 
are that all contracts entered into before the point that the UK leaves the EU will be guaranteed, even when those payments continue beyond the EU exit point. However, the UK Government has provided absolutely no certainty or clarity on what the replacement funding arrangements for these schemes will be once the UK has left the EU. On the 2nd of November, my colleague Finance Secretary Derek Mackay announced that the Scottish Government will be passing on in full to Scottish stakeholders the EU funding guarantees that have been offered by the UK Government. This will protect all spending commitments uh, from these schemes that are entered into in the period between now and the point that the UK proposes to leave the U EU. That provides certainty for over £700 million of EU funding for Scotland. Question number four, Gillian Martin. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what assessment it has made of the impact of the Autumn Statement on the oil and gas sector in Scotland. Cabinet Secretary Keith Brown. Uh, I was bitterly disappointed to learn that the Chancellor has provided no substantive measures to support the oil and gas sector, a sentiment which I am sure is shared by the hundreds of thousands yeah, yeah. of people supported by the industry, and in particular those in the northeast of Scotland who have been hardest hit during the downturn. The Cabinet Secretary for Finance and the Constitution wrote to the Chancellor outlining urgent measures which should be considered for inclusion in the Autumn Statement. These proposals were focused around increasing activity in late-life assets, protecting critical pieces of infrastructure and increasing exploration. Without greater investment and activity, we risk losing vital capacity and skills that will support production and ensure that we maximise economic recovery from the North Sea. The Scottish Government will continue to do everything within its powers to support the industry and its workforce through these challenging times. Julian Martin. Oil and Gas UK have made specific requests to the UK Government on measures to allow the industry to continue with exploration in these difficult times. What impact could this lack of action in uh, facilitating this exploration have in the future supply of oil and gas and the industry as a whole? Secretary. Uh, one of the major impacts will of course be the fewer number of people supporting the infrastructure which is already there and that brings into question the viability of that infrastructure. So you may have the situation where fields uh, are left redundant before the time when they should be. So that's a vitally important thing. And on that particular issue I met with the Chief Secretary to the uh, Treasury some months ago who assured me that back in June that the UK Government realised that they had not acted quickly enough on this and would now do so. We've had no action whatsoever in relation to loan guarantees for those vital pieces of infrastructure. And above that, of course, the UK Government holds uh, the tools in terms of uh, tax and tax concessions in relation to exploration. This was their chance yesterday to pay back uh, an industry which had put billions into the UK Treasury, which, according to the Treasury's own forecast, will put more billions back into the Treasury, and yet they did nothing. The Scottish Government will continue to support this industry whatever we can, unlike the UK Government. Jackie Bailey. I share the disappointment of the Cabinet Secretary at the autumn statement yesterday because the industry is of huge importance to the North East and to the economy of Scotland as a whole. Does the Cabinet Secretary therefore agree with Labour's proposals for a UK offshore investment limited to look at the assets to be supported with public investment and will he make common cause with us in taking on the UK Government to try and have this proposal agreed? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, we have undertaken a vast range of support measures, so the Transition Training Fund, uh, the money that we announced this week as part of the Aberdeen City deal for the Oil and Gas Technology Centre, uh, the Energy Jobs Task Force, so there's a range of support which the Scottish Government has provided. Now, if there was to be further investment, and of course we ask for that investment to take the form uh, of tax concessions in relation to exploration, if there's to be further investment, the UK Government has the tools to do that. Were they to show any willingness, then of course we would look to see what we could do in order to support that but it's quite evident from the way that things are just now we are not seeing that support from the UK government we will continue to support in the ways that I've said and of course we'll continue to look at other ways in which we can provide that support. Tavish Scott. Given the uh, Cabinet Secretary's points about the importance of the UK government changing its position from the one that they announced yesterday in the autumn statement will the Cabinet Secretary seek an early meeting with either the Chief Secretary or the relevant UK government minister to press the points that many of us right across this chamber want to see happening both on decommissioning and on the late life uh, asset transfer that are so important for the future of the industry? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, yes we will be seeking um, a, a meeting of that type uh, either myself 
uh, or also uh, the, the Cabinet Secretary for Finance. And it will centre on those points. And I know that Tavis Scott has raised the issue around tax before and having the right tax regime to encourage exploration and the full exploitation of remaining fields. So those are the main asks. But the one that we've, we've asked for before, which the UK government admitted that they had not taken action on sufficiently quickly, which was the ask of the industry for loan guarantees for infrastructure, will form the centrepiece of what we ask. But we will continue with that dialogue and I'm happy that we'll have the support of the Liberal Democrats in doing so. Question number five, Murdo Fraser. Uh, thank you. To ask the Scottish Government when it last met industry and consumer stakeholders to discuss the regulation of private car parks. Minister Hamza Youssef. Uh, I most recently met with Citizen, Citizens Advice Bureau to discuss private par parking practices just last month. Uh, Transport Scotland met with the representatives of the parking industry, Citizens Advice Scotland and Trading Standards Scotland on the 31st of August to discuss how we can deliver improvements to private parking practices across the country. A further meeting with the industry and consumer stakeholders is scheduled to take place next week. Murdo Fraser. Can I, I thank the Minister for his response. On Monday, I was contacted by a 90-year-old lady from Comrie who had been hit with a £100 penalty notice from the inappropriately named company Smart Parking because when she parked in the Canoole Street car park in Perth and she keyed her number plate into the ticket machine, she inadvertently entered a capital letter zero instead of a uh, capital letter O instead of a zero and got a £100 fine. Now, such a case is all too typical of the hundreds of live constituency cases I have in relation to this one uh, car park. Would the Minister agree that not only uh, are such uh, actions by this company an utter disgrace, but it's given that he has uh, the powers to act in this matter, because it is a devolved uh, matter under the competence of the Scottish Government, would he agree to meet with me and discuss how we can work together to try and, and clean up uh, practices in this industry? Minister. Yes, uh, of course I would agree to, to meet with uh, the member I've written to him and we've had an exchange of parliamentary questions. He probably knows the process, but I'll reiterate it once again. That there is a working group uh, that is looking at this. There are some complexities. He knows that uh, depending on which route we choose down to go. Is it keep a liability? Is it charters? Is it education? Uh, what route is it? And he knows that there is a working group established examining these issues. Uh, I should say we're also keen to hear what the UK government approach uh, is on this. Uh, and there's a meeting taking place today between my officials and the UK government. Uh, once uh, the meeting takes place next week with the stakeholders, uh, I will ensure that he's informed by Transport Scotland officials about that and of course by me on the back of that. But of course I'd be happy to take this issue on. I know it's one that has affected uh, uh, his constituents uh, on many occasions. Question number six, Christina McKelvey. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what its position is on the recent UN report on the impact of welfare reforms on disabled people in the UK. Minister Jean Freeman. The UN report published at the beginning of November concludes that there is reliable evidence that the UK government's treatment of disabled people has led to grave or systematic violations of the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. The evidence it rests on is drawn from a variety of policies the UK government have pursued, including abolishing the Independent Living Fund, the introduction of the bedroom tax, the work capability assessment and changes to personal independence payment. The Scottish Government has been consistent in our opposition to these policies and we do agree with the UN's conclusions and are pleased that the UN report acknowledged the very different approach that we are taking. But perhaps more importantly, I am pleased that the UN in its conclusions gives disabled people the recognition they deserve for the considerable suffering they have endured for so many years. It is indeed a great pity that the UK Government continues to refuse and to see and hear the real damage they are doing to our fellow citizens. Christina Mulcahy. Uh, can I thank the Minister for that uh, answer? And given, as, as she states as well, the UN report states that the UK Government welfare reforms have evidence of grave and systematic violations, violations of the rights of persons with disabilities. Which violation in the UN code does the Minister think is worse? Imposing the bedroom tax on poor people or taking away the independent living fund for disabled people? Minister. <laughs> I think the member knows that I can't possibly choose between two such appalling policies which have negatively impacted on so many disabled people. Last night I had the privilege of attending the Disability Agenda Scotland reception hosted by my colleague Neil Bibby on Equal Still Not, Why Not? 
where they point out, as we've found in our own social security consultation, the severe uh, mental distress as well as real damage that is done to uh, individuals because of the policies of the UK government and how they're pursuing them. And I am particularly disappointed in addition to the policies that Ms McKelvey mentions that the UK government's continued refusal to step back from their cuts to employment support allowance when they trumpet so loudly to us about the benefit of helping people into work. That is a real disappointment and I would hope that they would reconsider. Thank you. Before we come to First Minister's questions, members may wish to join me in welcoming to the gallery His Excellency Mr Torbjorn Solström, Ambassador of Sweden to the United Kingdom. Thank you.